I was going classroom to classroom, person to person, seeing if they had any interest in, in hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was hard until I saw the Lord use me, lead someone to Christ. And I had very little in common with this young man, but his heart was ready. And we met at the bar, he heard the gospel, and he said, I need this. And I said, are you sure? Like, you understand what I said? Because I've been I've been used to be rejected. He said, oh, I need this. And I was like, okay. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. <laughs> and here's a guy I barely knew, had nothing in common with, and he professed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he began to grow. And that is where I first learned about discipleship because I saw the Lord use me, lead someone to Christ. Welcome. So glad that you are with me, James. Uh, ex excited for our conversation today. Uh, for those who don't know, this is James Drake. You are the executive director of Crew South Florida. Is that That's correct? Right. That's right, Lewis. You got it. Big awesome. mouth full. <laughs> Mainly what I do is kick in the gates of hell full force. Praise God. Praise That's God, right, man. Uh, you know, my, my experience with Crew has always been uh, just conversations that I've had with people that I've, I disciple personally. So like, for example, uh, there's this girl named Cindy who's in our church. And one of her experiences, her, her greatest memory in our church is when she, or not in our church, in her college career, was when she was part of the crew ministry. Okay. And uh, I remember her, she's always telling me about these stories of how she would go out and she would evangelize people, how she would learn about discipleship, how people poured into her. And I mean, it was one of those, uh, one of those things that, that changed her life and impacted her. And it was one of those great memories that she had of being a Christian, especially early on. And, uh, and, and I know that crew does way more than that. I know that you guys do uh, a lot of campus ministries, but if you could just, uh, in, in a few words, describe like, what is the mission of crew and what do you guys exist for? You got it. Uh, we like to say that crew is a caring community that's passionate about connecting people to Jesus Christ. So no matter who you are, what you believe or don't believe, we want to help you grow in your faith, mm -hmm. and learn how to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, that, that means removing some barriers to faith. Uh, that can be intellectual or emotional, or maybe it just needs to be relational. So we'll spend the time, and we have a philosophy that you can belong before you believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're a, uniquely a Christian outreach that exists for non-members. So those are, those are kind of things within our DNA. Yeah. Then internally, you know, most people on staff, are really passionate about helping fulfill the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, you might know what the Great Commission is. Some of your audience members might not be because it's, it's yeah. kind of a real church term. Yeah. But in short, it's, it's helping people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. walk with him, and proclaim his message to the world. Mm. And so it comes from some of Jesus' last words. Whenever you have last words, especially if you know you're going to die, you usually measure those and you make sure there's there's great meaning and intent behind them. Yeah. And so with the Great Commission, which is the title that's been given to these last words of Jesus, he said to his disciples, the followers of Christ, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And know this, I'm with you always to the mm -hmm. end of the age. That's reassuring. <laughs> it is, it is, right? Because we need, I, I know I need the Lord. Yeah. Now, what crew's done so beautifully uh, since 1956, mm -hmm. and now 26,000 staff strong, a presence in 191 wow. countries around the world, the ministry simply built on, on, on these three things, win, build, send. Hmm. And that'll kind of framework a lot of what I say about discipleship today. Yeah. So win is evangelism. That's the whole go part of the Great Commission. Yeah. Build is the discipleship component. It's helping someone grow in their faith, understand the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And that's go into all the world and make disciples. So that's yeah. the build part. And then the last part, proclaim this good news to all nations. That's mm -hmm. missions. And so what we do is we win, build, send. Mm -hmm. Win, evangelism, build, discipleship, mm -hmm. send, missions. And it's all built on those last words of Jesus that we call the Great Commission. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, I, yeah. I think that an organization that exists for that purpose alone uh, is, is needed. You know, a lot of times uh, from a church perspective, I know that you're part of a church, I'm part of a church, but sometimes organizations such as Crew, Parachurch Ministries, can really come alongside of churches and, and help them to accomplish those goals as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so how, do your, how does your organization resource or partner with churches to be able to... Uh, to expand that Great Commission, not only in the in the campuses where you're at and throughout the cities, because I, I know you you do something right. a little bit different than the campus, yep. uh, but how do you guys do that with the local churches in mind? Well, I, I just want to underscore this fact. Mm -hmm. 
God's game plan A for changing the world is through the local church. And so I personally have a high view of the church. I submit myself to the leadership of a local church. And in the case here in Miami, I'm a pastor at my church. Mm -hmm. And so the whole term parachurch has an interesting history, and it can connotate an idea that we are outside of the church as Mm -hmm. an organization. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at all. Uh, You can think of it like the Apostles' Creed when it talks about the church universal, using the term Catholic church. Uh, it means universal church, mm-hmm. all of God's church around the world. Yeah, And I think crew really has a unique role in the sense of just specializing in this evangelism, discipleship, and mission component. Mm-hmm. And because it's so much bigger than any one church and so much greater than any one person, mm-hmm. uh, we've just been able to find staff that are uniquely called to kind of be the tip of the spear of the Great Commission. These are, these are the people that are just motivated like Paul. They don't want to build on other people's foundation. Mm-hmm. They, they've had a meaningful impact in their life. Somebody reached them at a formative time, mm-hmm. and they now have a passion because God has redeemed and restored brokenness in their life, usually during those formative years on college especially, because mm-hmm. those four years are going to send your life on a trajectory for the next 40. Yeah. And when God meets them there, they rightly get passionate about the concept of campus ministry. So a lot of our staff come from campus because they've been discipled by somebody that's just a few steps down the road Mm -hmm. and met them where they were and when they were deciding what to do with their life they were they were confronted with the word of god Mm -hmm. and the call to live for the glory of god and and it changes a person's heart when they really wrestle with that and get that Mm -hmm. and so a lot of our graduating seniors do an internship and then a remnant i would say i don't know maybe 10 20 percent decide to become long-term staff now one thing that we teach as a ministry is called 100% sent. No matter where you go or what you do, you are a laborer for the Lord for a lifetime. You are yeah. 100% sent. In, in, in church talk, that's the whole priesthood of all believers. Yeah. You know, everyone has unique gifts and abilities that God's given them, and we are to use them. You'll see that in 1 Peter 4 and Romans chapter 12. Mm-hmm. So how does crew support the local church? We just basically give people the tools in the context of the local church mm to come to know Christ, to grow in their relationship with Christ, Mm -hmm. and then to effectively serve Christ. Yeah. Well, praise God, man. I I know personally, uh, whenever I've tried to learn how to disciple people, you know, one of the the big things that I, that I try to help people to do is to get established in the spiritual disciplines. Yeah. And uh, one of the big spiritual differences that changed my life, you know, was reading the Bible. I think it was, uh, as Christians, sometimes we, we have this mindset of, we know it's important to read the Bible. We know it's important to pray. Like these things we, we know. Like we go to church and it's like, what are they going to preach to us about? Right. Getting connected with God, right? Connecting to his word, connecting to prayer. But many times it becomes difficult to actually get into the habit of doing those things. And so one of the things that I use personally in my ministry is uh, a resource that you guys created. Uh, it's it's uh, 555 uh, uh, for reading the Bible. And it goes through the whole Fantastic. New Testament, uh, five minutes a day. Uh, five days a week, and it's uh, I, th- I think it's like five different points, something like that. But it's uh, it's really approachable. It's a really approachable way to right. get people into the habit of creating those church dis- yep. th- those disciplines of of spirituality, so that they can grow. That's right. And so, man, I, I think resources like that have been beneficial. Uh, I was perusing your website uh, earlier, and I was I was looking at all of the different resources that you guys provide, and and I love that it's free of charge. Yeah. You know, as as I see the the care that you guys have for for the community, for the church, and really for that mission of making disciples. Right. That's right. Uh, and so, my question to you is: How did you get plugged into this? How did you? <laughs> how did crew impact you? How did discipleship impact your life? You got it. Well, um, I'd like to share that story, but uh, before I do, something you said really just caught my attention, and it's all these resources that crews made available. You know, the heart behind that is because to effectively disciple, things need to be transferable. Mm. Even Jesus, when he taught, he used these ideas and these concepts that people understood. Mm. The fields are ripe for harvest, but the labors are few. Mm. I'm the living waters. You know, people, people resonated and they understood these illustrations. And so discipleship needs to be transferable. And maybe in a little bit of our conversation, we can talk a little bit, of the difference between uh, evangelism Mm -hmm. and multiplication. And I think both of them play an important role in terms of discipleship. Yeah. But when you look at multiplication and how do I entrust this, 2 Timothy 2, 2, 
what you've heard me say and trust into reliable people who will go and do likewise. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul had a great mind and he, he was a very well studied mind. He spoke multiple languages. He was yeah. very passionate about proclaiming these religious truths to people. And ultimately when he found a relationship with Jesus, he turned his world upside down and inside out. Yeah. And he saw everything for what it was. And even then he took a time to study so that he could articulate these truths in a profound but simple way. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you experience on the crew website is hopefully that is here are some transferable resources yeah. that take really profound truths and try to boil them down so that everyone can get it, explain it and share it. That's now, good. yeah. So I just wanted to encourage <laughs> yeah, you with no, that. No, no, so I'm course. glad you experienced that. Yeah. Hey, I hope you are enjoying today's episode. If you are getting value out of this episode, let me ask you to just take a moment. And if you're watching on YouTube to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you can be notified of all of the different updates and videos that we post on this channel. Without further ado, let's continue to listen in on this conversation. Um, now, pertaining to my story and crew, it's interesting. I came to Christ in college. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where I really started to walk with the Lord. I, I had, I had kind of grown up in a, a little bit of a church setting. Um, I had heard the gospel. I knew I needed a savior at age 12, but, uh, it really wasn't until my freshman year that I was confronted with the reality of Jesus Christ is not only savior, but Lord. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I bit my knee my freshman year, a chaplain of all people of a fraternity mm. that I was pledging for all the wrong reasons, uh, became my big brother. Mm. And he said, you're going to read this book. And I didn't have a choice in the matter. And it was called yeah. absolute Sur surrender by Andrew Murray. Okay. And I've read it since, and it's like a cure for insomnia now. But at that <laughs> point in my life, at that point in my life, it just convicted me. Man, did it convict me. And I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I really, I've made a mess of things. Um, I've ultimately lived like a practical atheist as though I was God, and, mm. and I'm sorry about that. And I've made a mess of things, and if you'll have me, I'm yours. As best I know how, I surrender. Mm. It was something along those lines. But, man, I really meant it. And no dove came down, you know, <laughs> nothing really happened. I got up and I, and I couldn't help but wonder if things would change, but I knew I meant it and I believed it. Mm. And it was two nights later that I was a party and by God's grace, I had a different desire. Mm. And for the first time in my life, I could head in a new direction. Mm. Um, and I sensed that that was the Holy Spirit beginning his work in yeah. my heart and life. And it wasn't long after that, that I saw a beautiful girl walk by and I said, man, Lord, I pray you'll give me a woman like that one day. <laughs> And she was beautiful on the inside and out. And uh, never in a million years would I thought Heidi would become my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a senior when I was a freshman. Mm -hmm. She was a girls' honor society president. Had 15 track and field records. I was just a lowly freshman trying to make my way as a walk on on the football team and earn my keep out there. And mm -hmm. anyways, uh, she had a purity and zeal about her that uh, I, I just wondered what she had. Mm -hmm. And it was a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. so. Um, she asked me if I went to church. I said, well, I'd be happy to go to church wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I started going to church and there week in and week out, I, I just heard God's word preached mm -hmm. and, um, I was asked to volunteer with the youth and I started memorizing some scriptures mm -hmm. so I would be better equipped to do that. And so God's word was just changing me from the inside out. Mm -hmm. I know my parents looked at me like I was a little bit crazy and a little zealous and they yeah. were wondering when I was going to kind of grow out of this phase. But, uh, here I am, uh, 24 years later, uh, stronger than ever <laughs> in terms of my convictions <laughs> well, that yeah. this is the truth and it needs to be proclaimed that it's changed right. my life. Right. Your parents, uh, they weren't they weren't following Christ at that time? So my father, and I'm, I'm dragging this story out of how I got connected to crew, but uh, to answer yeah. your question, um, my father would say that he came to Christ later in his journey. Mm. Um, I think it's really powerful. Both Heidi and my parents would testify that um, because of our engagement with crew, mm -hmm. And when they saw what we were doing and how we were investing our careers, mm -hmm. um, they were deeply compelled and convicted by their own walk with the Lord. And mm -hmm. uh, they would both tell you that that's when they really started growing leaps and bounds. So we're blessed on both sides of the family. My father's gone on to be with the Lord. Okay. And I have absolute peace in my heart that I will see him in the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. Hopefully with a few less rough edges, but uh, <laughs> I'll see him and me too, okay. for that matter. And uh, my mom, she's... She's up in Asheville, North Carolina. I've tried to get her down here in Miami, and my sister's out in San Francisco, but uh, she she loves it there, and mm -hmm. um, she's all alone. But she, she tells me, no, I'm not alone. The Lord's with me. Mm -hmm. And she's reading his word. She's connected into a local church. She's grown in her faith. I see it. It's real. Mm -hmm. um, I praise God for it. My in-laws, awesome. same thing. My father-in-law, 
Uh, he was not a Christian in college. My mother-in-law dated him, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she led him to the Lord. He got caught up in what he would consider a cult. I, I, they're, they're within the boundaries of orthodoxy, but they mm -hmm. focus on a few issues that just consume their theology. And mm -hmm. at one point, he thought he lost his salvation. He spiraled into depression. And then when he was raising my wife and his son, they just kind of they were just kind of lukewarm because mm. he had had such a bad experience. Yeah. And then when he saw my wife um, really start just, she was passionate about the Lord and sharing her faith and leading people to Christ, mm -hmm. it convicted him. And uh, this was a man who used to sell uh, uh, Jesus uh, storybook Bibles door to door when he came to Christ, <laughs> you know, because he wow. came to Christ later in life. So he's, he, he was passionate. So it just, it rekindled in him a spark that was already there. And on all sides of our family, you uh, we, we're seeing the Lord at work, and we praise Him for that. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, uh, I don't remember having any significant conversations with either of my parents, mm -hmm. uh, nor does Heidi, and pertaining to a lot of, you know, just matters of faith. I yeah. think it was it undergirded our worldview. Uh, we both had wonderful parents who loved us and cared mm -hmm. for us and provided well. Um, but, but yeah, I, I know my parents, and I, I think Heidi's parents would say the same. If, if they could go back and do it differently, maybe they would. I, I think mm. they did the absolute best they could. Yeah. Um, but I think those seeds that were planted, you know, in terms of expectations, just the exposure to church, mm -hmm. I, I never denied the existence of God. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, and so when I was confronted that freshman year, um, I was more convicted that what I believed wasn't changing the way I lived. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that that really convicted me because I, I realized I was a hypocrite. Nobody wants to be a hypocrite. Nope. <laughs> and so anyways, I, I long story short, I kept growing in my relationship with the Lord, serving with the youth. Mm -hmm. When we were challenged, Heidi was now in grad school. She had got her surgical physician assistance license wow. and degree. It's a big uh, title. Uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> mouthful. And the things she did was amazing. And lung and heart surgery and thora cardiothoracic wow. surgery. I mean, she, she's really a very capable and talented woman. Um, what was interesting is that when we both graduated, her from grad school and me from undergrad, mm -hmm. uh, we were challenged by two different missionaries to basically tithe our careers. Wow. So what you do with your money, they said, why don't you do with your career? Wow. And we're like, I don't know. Why not? So we felt called to missions mm -hmm. and that's what we were going to do. We're just going to do it temporarily, you know, short term. Mm -hmm. And, uh, here we are 20 years later, still, <laughs> still going full time in missions. And I, I do want to encourage any listener, mm -hmm. uh, you just never know what the Lord's going to do sometimes. We had a plan on going overseas, uh, serving on mission, knew God had called us, mm -hmm. and we were going with this one organization, and we had told everybody our, our wedding cakes were, were <laughs> Kiwis because we're headed to New Zealand That's, okay. for whatever reason, where they wanted to send us. And we were so excited, and, and Heidi had turned down all these big jobs as a PA and myself at business school, and we're just... We're going on the mission field. And right when it was time to board that plane, mm. the team dissolved over there. Wow. Christians couldn't get along. Who would, who would have think, right? Yeah. <laughs> Never seen that before. <laughs> and so the, the team dissolved, and we had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting there thinking, man, did, did we miss God's will for our life? Did, mm. Was this not supposed to be? Like, what, what happened? Yeah. And so we waited for months. And during that month of just trying to figure out what was next, mm -hmm. um, my father um, had connected at an Anglican church in Atlanta, Georgia, and one of the pastor's daughter had come back on furlough from the mission field, mm -hmm. and she was from New Zealand. And he's like, son, I know you're going through a hard time and all this, but you might want to meet them. Well, I, yeah. we had dinner with this girl. She connected us with the national director of New Zealand, mm -hmm. and uh, this is unbelievable. Same country, same city. Mm -hmm. Same campus we were supposed to be going to. Okay. Thriving team. Yeah. And so I can see the Lord's providential hands, many of the plans in the heart, but it's his purpose that prevails. And what I thought we were going to go do, he had something so much better. Mm -hmm. And so he called us to that country. He called us that city. And we had to wait on his perfect timing. Yeah. And then he opened up a door and an option we didn't even know existed. Yeah. And it was with Campus Crusade for Christ. By the oh, way, wow. I had never shared my faith mm -hmm. with using the four spiritual laws or anything else like that. Mm -hmm. So that first week on campus was a shock. When I was going, you know, classroom to classroom, person to person on campus, yeah, asking uh, questions and seeing if they had any interest in in hearing the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and it was hard. And I remember seeing planes fly overhead and think, 
man, I want to be on the next one of those going home. This is not for me. <laughs> yeah. Until I saw the Lord use me, lead someone to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I had very little in common with this young man. Um, but his heart was ready. And we met at the bar mm -hmm. and he heard the gospel and he said, I need this. And I mm -hmm. said, are you sure? Like, you understand what I said? Cause I've been, I've been used to be rejected. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, I need this. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, well, here's a suggested prayer. And mm -hmm. would you like to pray it? And he's like, yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. <laughs> and, and here's a guy I barely knew, had nothing in common with in, a, in the context of a bar. And the Holy Spirit was convicting him. Mm. And he professed the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. And he began to grow. And that is where I first learned about discipleship because I, I, I saw the Lord use me, lead someone to Christ. Yeah. And over that year, we saw 70 other students come to Christ. Wow. Which Praise was amazing. God. Yeah. No, it really mm. was. And a lot of us were, were, were first generation believers. This young man that I led to Christ, mm -hmm. He actually led his father to Christ, who both of them got baptized at wow. our local church <laughs> in so New cool. Zealand. Yeah, so it was just, it was amazing to think like, wow, God can use me. Like, mm. I don't know, I didn't, at that point, I hadn't gone to seminary. I, I was still learning yeah. my understanding of the Bible, but I, I knew just enough to, mm. to tell people the truths that had transformed my heart and life. Yeah. And, and, and God used that. Wow. And he met me where I was to, to give my life great eternal meaning, value, and significance. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's where my passion comes from because I want that for everybody. Yeah, I want everybody to know that God can use them mm -hmm. to help change the world. And his way of changing the world is through discipleship, one yeah. person at a time. You know, people ask me, uh, how'd you get into fostering? Because we, we have a sweet little foster daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's because we became aware of all the brokenness in our city and it was all systemic if you went upstream to fatherlessness. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that you could actually do about that was adopt these children. There's about a thousand kids in foster care right now that need homes. Mm -hmm. And if you can get them in loving Christian homes, then the philosophy and thought is you can prevent a lot of uh, homelessness, mm -hmm. unwanted, risky, and de deviant behavior, high, high school dropout rates, mm -hmm. and then unwanted pregnancy yeah. and, and, and poverty. All these things can be prevented if you go upstream mm -hmm. and try and meet these kids where they are. And so when you're confronted with a thousand, you're like, what, what are we going to do? What kind of campaign? And then you yeah. come to realize you, you can't do for everybody right. what you wish, but you can do it for somebody. And so mm -hmm. you might not be able to change the world, but you can change somebody's world. Right. And so that's what led us down the path of adoption. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Christians need to know is that the best way to change in the world is to change your world, mm -hmm. starting with the opportunities and the people right in front of you that God's place. Yeah. You can't reach everybody, but you could reach somebody. Yeah, you, know? you got it. You got yeah. it. And that's, I think that's, that's the viewpoint of what we do as, as part of our ministry that at Empowering Disciples, like that's the goal, you know, it's not like we're going to reach everybody and, you know, spread evangelism and discipleship to every corner of the world. But if this podcast could help somebody, if it could change the life of somebody who may not know that, that feeling of what it means to, to go out in faith and actually share your faith and see somebody come to Christ and come to that realization that, wait a minute, this is real. God was there. He was, I, I felt his presence in that moment, moment when I was sharing with this person and God gave me the, 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 the reward to see this person come to Christ. Hey, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of that episode. I hope you got value out of that. As always, please make sure to rate and review us on whatever podcasting platform you're watching this on. And if you'd like to partner with us on Patreon, you can do so with the link on our bio. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you all next week.